that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. We'll just say hello. Do you want to say hello first this time? <laughs> <laughs> You're so good at it. <laughs> okay. Hello, everybody. This is George Harvey and Tom Fennell, and we're going to give you a slideshow. Hi there. On, um, on microgrids, so that you can know as much as we do. In fact, when we're done with this, you might know more than we do. I don't know. Now, what do I have to do to get this you slideshow have to, going? You have to click up here. Over here. Oh, to get it on the screen. To get it on the yep. screen. Okay. It's All right. On the we're gonna we're gonna do the slideshow on microgrids. Now, what you do, Tom, is just do the down key. Down key. You mean enter? No. Oh, no. down the down, down, down arrow. Yeah. Try it and see. There you go. Take it up again. Up key. Okay. So this isn't going to be scrolling. Okay. It, no, it does not I'm scroll. Have to, uh, you, you do oh, down okay, key for, good. for every one. Okay. What we're what we're looking at here, you know, we're going to be that's talking. That's Greenfield. That's Greenfield, Massachusetts. That's right, and that's the way. That's the way I think most Americans really want to live. They want to live in a place which is predictable, quiet. They don't worry about the guy on the motorcycle down the street. Um, that's Greenfield, and that's the way we would like things to be. But of course, they can't always be that way. And that's what sometimes happens. Things go wrong. You know where this was. That was um, looks like a tornado. It was uh, actually that was a hurricane that did that, and that's from FEMA. And it seems to me that it was in the south, but I don't remember. It was not Katrina, but it was a uh, it was a mess. Did a pretty good job of that church. It sure did. Yep, and a few other buildings around. <laughs> and a few. But others. you know, it's not it's not just roofs that come off. You know, we've got other things going wrong. Well, the next picture, I think, shows that. Yeah, Should go ahead. Up? Yeah, yeah, sometimes you lose your ground floor. <laughs> oh, these poor people. Can you imagine coming home to your house and discovering that you've lost the ground floor? <laughs> How do I get up there? How do I get up there? Well, one thing you don't do is get, get up, up there. If I get up there, is it going to come down? Yeah, right. You, you don't go up there because the, somebody in the police department is going to, or the, or the civil... Uh, um, uh, defense or something like that. It's going to say, no, 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 that may be your house, but you're not allowed to go into it. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, your your collection of jewelry and the Picassos that you have on the wall and things like that, you just, you know, you have to give up on them, at least for, for now. A while. <laughs> for a while. For a while. Okay. And, and uh, there's other things that can happen, too. And we're showing you these things. Now, here's a road. That road is really kind of useless. To bring in, <laughs> <laughs> at least from this end. <laughs> yeah, right. Can you imagine that 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 entire bridge has been circumvented by the river? You know, here comes the here comes the trucks that are going to come in and and fix the the uh, utility lines and get everybody's yeah, right. electricity back in order. No, I'm sorry, not going to happen this week or next either. Um, <clears throat> and the question, of course, is what do you do? about power when you're dealing with things like this. But, of course, we've got other things going on like tornadoes and, and, and uh, they, have you ever been in a, in a never place where there was a tornado? been near where tornadoes happen, but yeah, I, I never see I tornado. used to live in Illinois, I never saw a tornado. I was born in Kansas, never saw a tornado, but I did have a friend and a tornado came down about 60 feet from his house. Mm. <laughs> and the tornado funnel was so small, it was only about 20, 25 feet across where it hit the ground. And what it did was it came down in a group of trees and it just wrapped them around each other. No kidding. Yeah. Well. Wow. But, you know, that's what happens. Let's, let's get back in action here. We've got other problems. And, of course, tornadoes are not that common in Vermont, but there are other problems problems that happened. And of course the tornado, did, that one tornado did hit Springfield. Um, well, Massachusetts. Well, a, a tornado passed through the Green Mountain National Forest from Arlington to Wardsboro. Oh, did it? The, uh, every, that was the first tornado ever registered in Vermont. It wasn't really? Yeah. Wow. This is much more common. 
Yep, they happen. But, uh, you know, as the, as the slide says, we can have storms from outer space. Let's look at what one of those looks like. Now, that's the sun with a solar ejection. This is NASA artwork. I'm pretty sure that's not a photograph. Although, the way they're doing photographs of the sun these days, they could be. They almost could be. They, you know, if they've got ways of doing solar. But you see the ball <laughs> up there at the top of that, photo, of that artwork? That's Earth. That's the size of the Earth. Wow. That storm is huge compared to the Earth. I've got no idea what the, ma the mass is of the, of the gases in that thing. But they're going to weigh, this is not going to be a ton or two of gas. This is going to be millions and millions and millions of ton of ionized gas. And ionized means it's full of power. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. Let's keep going. And it, some of this stuff hits Earth. Some of it hits Earth. And some it of, does, sometimes it, hit, it causes problems. It, sometimes it causes problems. We'll go on here. And um, this is a, a graphic of, uh, obviously not a photograph. This is not a photograph. But it's, it's a graphic of what happens. This ionized mass hits the Earth, and it does a whole bunch of different things. And one of the things can be include ruining infrastructure. And you know about the Carrington event. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. I don't know what year that was. I think it might have been oh. 1857. It was. Yeah, it was, you're very close. 57, 58. Yeah. It was in the 50s. The only thing we had was telegraph. Yeah, and it wrecked our telegraph system. <laughs> they, there were sparks. A solar storm hit the Earth, and it and it went through the telegraph lines, mm -hmm. and it it put so much charge on the lines that the telegraph keys were sending and receiving information even though they were disconnected from any power source. Mm -hmm. Sparks were jumping, telegraph offices caught on fire, mm -hmm. and it was the worst solar storm on record that, that we know of because, because we, we really don't know a lot about solar storms aside from that they, that they cause auroras. Well, Prior there's, there's to that some going on now, and fortunately the <clears throat> ejections have missed Earth. Yeah, we had an ejection about a year ago. Yep. And uh, let's let's go on a little bit. Um, this is what this is actually a really impressive photograph of the aurora. That's pretty. That's pretty. That's that's the way we like solar storms to look when they <laughs> when they hit the Earth. You know, they they light up the skies. Now, there's a lot of energy in that light up there. Oh and yeah. The, there are places where this is a very common thing to see. But solar storms, as we said, the Carrington event was disastrous. And um, when, an, when an event like that happens, it can, be, it can just wreck our electric infrastructure. Transformers are particularly vulnerable. Right. Let's go on. They can, they can um, the, oh, what was it? I think it was FEMA, or maybe it was FERC, said that this solar mass that just barely missed us would have put our entire electric grid down for a period of years, a year and a half or more. More than that, because you don't buy these transformers off the shelf. That's right. Somebody's got to make them, and their plant is out of business because they got no power. That, well, <laughs> actually, that's maybe it's true and maybe it's not, because yeah. they aren't in the United States. We don't have any. We don't have any anymore. They're, but, in, they're in other places now. And, but they're not off-the-shelf items. No. You have to order them special. And if you have every transformer in the United States going, you're going to have at least 60% of the transformers in Europe going. Most of the, many of their transformers are protected better than ours. But um, so th there's going to have to be a lot of transformers built for all over the world. It would be very grim It would be a grim thing. If this yeah. happened. And it could happen. Yeah, it I could mean, happen. Well, they, they said it, it could have happened. We... We missed it by a day or two, by a couple of days, three days maybe it was. Well, a friend of mine who studies this stuff said that there was a 40% chance that we could have one. And this was about five years ago. They come and they go yeah. in a cycle. Yeah. And we just got through the peak yeah. of the cycle. So we're not likely to have one for another 10 years yeah. or so. So <laughs> we, can, we have some pretty good hope. Um, the, the things, as you mentioned, that are the most uh, uh, vulnerable are... Um, Transformers. Yeah. Let's go to the next picture. Well, the, the, the power lines themselves act as antennae. They act as antennae. <laughs> That's they right. They pick up the, the sparks. Yeah. And they hit the transformer, 
And the transformer is not ready for something like that. And yep. Oops. You know, yep. it's, it's, it's burnt right out. It's burnt right out. And these are the transformers all grouped together. And the, and the power this lines. This is down by Yankee, isn't it? I don't think so. I think that's in the Midwest. I, I went onto the power, onto the, uh, onto, a lot of these images come from Wikimedia Yeah, Commons. this is not Yankee. No. I'm looking at it now. But we've got one down there that looks very much like this. Now, these things can be protected. Mm -hmm. And we should be moving on protecting them. Mm -hmm. Let's go down a picture and look at that. Here are two girls in a, in a Faraday cage. <laughs> and the Faraday cage is protecting them. And Tom, you tell me if I'm looking at this picture and seeing the right, right thing. It looks to me like that Faraday cage has been put right on top of a Van de Graaff generator. It has, yes. Okay. It has. <laughs> we know what Van de Graaff generators do. They make huge, huge, huge sparks. These are the things that... We used to call atom smashers when I was a kid. Yeah. 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 So, you know, you can protect things, but we haven't got there yet in terms of protecting them. There's an interesting picture of Nikola Tesla. Yeah. Sitting in a rocking chair, reading a book underneath the Van de Graaff generator <laughs> with sparks flying everywhere. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I went to a I went to a high school um, uh, talk that a guy gave, and he had a little Van de Graaff generator. Mm. It was about mm. six feet tall mm. that he brought in, mm. and he had sparks flying all over the place. Oh, they're fun. Yeah, yeah they are fun. <laughs> you can make them and have them in your house if you want, if you're willing to do that. <laughs> okay, let's go on. All right, we've got other problems, too. Uh, one of them is terrorism, and FEMA has told us that uh, about a year ago, if a terrorist had attacked the United States by taking out seven transmission sites and one factory, it could put our entire grid down for a period of up to four years. That's a long time to go without employment. Yeah, it is. And there would be a lot of people going without employment. Yep. But, you know, there it is. We have um, other problems. North Korea, having heard that we just got mi missed by a by a uh, coronal ejection by a couple of days that would have brought our grid down and having seen the FEMA broadcast told us that they had a bomb and they could take us down for years. Well, they just announced that they now have a submarine capable of launching that bomb. So they're a little bit more scary than they were two weeks ago. Yeah, well, <laughs> I don't know what to say about North Korea. I don't think anybody really does. What's, what's real and what's imaginary? Yeah, right. You don't know. Yeah, okay. I don't know. So here's the question. Would you be willing to pay less for a more secure power source? Duh. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. This really is the question. Would you be willing to pay less for a more secure power source? What do you think about that? Now here we have, this is the, <laughs> this is the main square in the capital city of the nation of Tokelau. That's the main square. That's, That's the main the playground. square. <laughs> well, they have a playground in their main square. But this That's is an nice. interesting little place. Tokelau, a couple of years ago, went 100% solar. 100% solar? 100% before Tesla's battery. Huh. Interesting. <laughs> they went 100% solar, and they had solar plus battery backup, and then for a, for a third backup system, for a second backup system, they had, they had they got diesel, diesel yep. generators. They've got three islands, and the diesel generators run on stuff that they grow locally. So what in the world are you doing, Tom? Well, I pushed this, and it changed, it changed the, yeah. uh, the picture, so I'm trying push. to get back, and it doesn't want to do it. Uh-huh. Okay, push F5. Nothing is happening. All right, push escape. Push what? Escape. Uh-huh. Nope. Yeah, yeah, I'm back. You're back. Okay. It's now working, push F5 again. again. F5 again? F5, F5 again. No. Try doing the down key and the up key. Well, they're working, it's so working. let's just yep. keep going. We're, we're working. Okay. So anyway, um, we, we, here we are at Tokelau. Let's take a look at SAMHSA. Next, next picture. Here is SAMHSA. Sam, the people on SAMHSA... The people on Tokelau had a problem, and the problem was the price of oil. It was costing them 60 cents per kilowatt hour to generate electricity because they had to import the oil to do 60 it. 60 cents. 60 wow. cents. In some islands, it costs up to a dollar. SAMHSA is another one like that, and SAMHSA is off the coast of Denmark. Let's take a look at SAMHSA. Up. Oh, 
Well, wrong one. I there you go. Oh, we were looking at Samson. We were, but yeah. let's do this. Here we go. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't looking at Samson. Samson is off the coast of Denmark. They had the same problem, even though they were close to Europe. And the problem at Samsa was addressed by putting up wind turbines. Okay. The people there just put up wind turbines, and uh, they have some of their own biomass that they use. But, you know, there it is. And they're saving an enormous amount of money. And, in fact, they are exporting um, energy from the island. So, the, so the, their wind turbines provide them with income. Okay. Okay? I saw on one of the... One of the blogs we talked about today, mm -hmm. that there was a fee for winter, for solar, yeah. $150 for a wind farm, something like that, $150, how frequently they were levying that fee, I guess once a year. I don't know. That's not very much, and it was still generating a lot, a lot, of, of, a lot of money. A lot of money, yeah. Let's keep going here. Um, our next picture is Gussink, and Gussink is an important example. In 1992, Gussink had an unemployment... Gussink, first of all, is on the border between Austria and Hungary. It's in Austria. It has that little castle that you see there. Yeah. Which is, which is a... Um, it's a tourist attraction, but people, you know, in order for tourists to go see the castle, they have to be nearby anyway, and Gussink isn't near anything, so it didn't have very many tourists. And 70% uh, of their workers were unemployed locally. So they had to take a, a bus or a train or whatever to Vienna, which took several hours, and stay there for the week and then come back on the weekend. Wow. And that is, you know, and that yeah. meant that not only did they not have local work, they had to pay for a place to stay in Vienna. In Vienna, right. So this is a town that had some serious problems. And they, they elected a local government that said, we know what to do. We're going to stop this. We can save 6 million euros a year by by having our own power system. And okay. so they did. They put in a wind turbine, they put in a bio uh, uh, digester, they put in a uh, Yenbacher um, uh, diesel generator which, which used gas from the bio yeah. digester. And uh, now, uh, 20 some odd years later, they have had Hundreds of people move into this town to take advantage of local jobs that had opened well, up. Well, that's an interesting story. All right. Isn't it? Yeah. Now, in that picture there, yeah. there's, there's blue at the bottom. Is that a lake or is that solar panel? I don't know. I honestly don't know. I, I kind of suspect that it's a lake, but it might be solar panels on a, on a field. They've, they've really gone in for renewable power in a big yeah. way. Yeah. They, also, they also manufacture their own local diesel oil which okay. is made from rapeseed, which okay. is basically canola. Canola, yeah. And uh, so they're, they're, uh, these people, these people have, have said, you know, our livelihoods are dependent on power. So we're going to make our own, we're going to have our own. And I will point out that anybody can do that by having their own power system, their own microgrid and so forth. Let's keep going. We're going to see more and more of that happening yep. just because it makes good economic yep, sense. Yeah, absolutely. Now yeah, here is, is an interesting place. It's the Brattleboro Retreat. Yeah. Which, you know, it's a they, local it's, microgrid. It is a local microgrid. They went to, um, uh, uh, what was it, CVPS. CVPS. And they said, we should be getting a, 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 a break on power because we use so much. And CVPS said no. And the people at the retreat went and thought about that for a while and came back and said, we should be getting a, a break. And the people at CVPS said no. And they said, you don't understand. If we don't get a break, we're not going to be your customer anymore. <laughs> and the people at CVPS said, okay. <laughs> and then the next thing you know, the people at CVPS noticed that this bill that they had that used to be in thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars every month had suddenly gone to zero. Yeah. <laughs> they went back to the treat and said, how are you doing this? And the people at the retreat said, well, we got ourselves a couple of diesel generators and we're generating, generating our own power. And what happened as a result of that was that CVPS offered the Brattleboro Retreat power at a price that was one cent per kilowatt hour more than it cost the retreat to make the power. Okay. 
So you say, well, why would the retreat buy power at that price? It's simple. It's because at that price, if they needed to buy some power, they could instead of starting up another diesel generator. They had three diesel generators. So if they were in that zone where it would be only part of the, of the output of a diesel generator, they would buy the power. Another thing that they would do is they would cut themselves off from the grid if CVPS needed power, or they could even supply CVPS with power. Well, I think that's part of the agreement with CVPS, which is now Green Mountain Power. Right. That was part of the agreement. They would Because they were getting a very that. good electrical rate they, contingent on the fact that they were a standby generator right. for CVPS if CVPS asked them to be. That's correct. And I don't think they ever did. I don't know. They could have. <laughs> But they, they got a very good they got a very good rate. Now let's let's look at what the next thing is. This is a picture of a microgrid, and you can see the various components. Microgrid keeps the money for power in the local economy. Wow. That's good. What's and better is what's coming next. It it can also power the community when the grid fails. That's that that's the one that appeals to me. When the grid fails, it's hard to make money your business shuts down unless you've got a business that doesn't need power. And how many of them are that? Yeah. The, the microgrid has, has a bunch of components which keep it going. It has its own generating equipment. You can see in there pictures of, uh, on the right, uh, wind turbines and solar. And you could add a bunch of things to that. You could add biomass, you could add biodigesters, you could add, and the biodigesters can come from a municipal waste system. Oh yeah. They can come from farms, they can come from food waste. Compost. Compost, yeah. all of that can be biodigested. You can get a, a large and appreciable quantity of your power that you've been paying millions of dollars for from something that you have been that paying money to get rid <laughs> yeah. of. Yeah. And so you can power your, your community to a large extent on that. And then you've got the buildings and the various businesses and homes and so forth that use the power. And then finally, you've got a connection to the grid in the upper right-hand corner. This, by the way, came from the Microgrid Institute. And by the way, there could be microgrids within microgrids. Yep. And without micro. Yeah, bigger, they can be bigger, connected to, to each other. All sorts of things. Theoretically, you could have a network of microgrids in a state like Vermont in which every community has one or more microgrids, and they're all connected with each other. And if the, if the grid went down, those microgrids would support each other. Mm -hmm. And you could have basically the equivalent of a grid in operation. Mm -hmm. If you had enough connections of that type. The technology exists already. It's right. just a matter of hooking everything up. Yep. And it will happen. I think it will happen. I, I have no doubt that it will happen. Ah, here's a component. You could put solar on a roof of a medieval building. We don't have any in, in Brattleboro. <laughs> but there it is, solar on a roof of a medieval building. Um, here is a solar farm in Tennessee. It looks an awful lot like a bunch of solar farms in Vermont and Massachusetts. It certainly does. It sure does. They're all basically very, very similar. But there's another opportunity, and that is that you can do it on a community basis. Now, here are solar panels operating as a sun shield for parked cars. And it You're going to see more and more of that going oh, on. Oh, absolutely. You can put those over. I mean, on, with the cars, they help preserve the, the paint on the car mm -hmm. from all kinds of acid rain from pigeon droppings. But you can see that on, you can see that over um, uh, sidewalks, you could see it over uh, garden, uh, you know, the, the old uh, German beer garden could be covered with solar panels to keep Yeah, but you sun spoil on. the beer garden then. Oh, uh, how? <laughs> with, with solar panels? Yeah, you wouldn't be able to see the sun. You wouldn't be able to sit there and drink in the beer shade. In the sun. You could drink it in the yeah, shade. You can, you can do that. Yeah, okay. Well, we, and we did see a highway we, with. This right yes, in the middle of it. Yes, in the middle with people bicycling. Bicycling, you, yep. You put these things over canals. Let's keep going. And there's a lot of different ways. I just chose one to show here because it's one I don't see very much. On the show today, we had uh, solar thermal with, with uh, the sunshine heating up from a trough, heating up some sort of pipe. Here is a, the sun concentrated from a dish on a Stirling engine. Yeah. The Stirling engine is a is an interesting kind of engine that operates. It's a reciprocating engine. It's, a it's reciprocating not an internal combustion. Engine. It has no fuel. <laughs> it operates on, on the heat. on heat on yeah. the difference between 
warm air in one place and cold air in another. And the most efficient of these, the smallest of the very efficient ones, will actually work if you put the one in the palm of your hand. The heat of your hand will cause a reciprocating engine to, to run. Well, you can buy them on the internet. You yeah, can. They're, they're like kids' toys. They're, things, they're yeah. kids' toys. But you can also get Educational them. Educational toys. Yeah, you can also get them to, uh, to uh, produce power. Let's, let's continue. Okay, here is a wind turbine. It's a kind of wind turbine that might be used in a very small local microgrid. Let's look at the next one. Here is a wind turbine. I love this picture. Yeah, we've talked about this one this before. This is the hospital in Greensburg, Kansas. Now, Greensburg, Kansas is a city that is a mile by a mile and a half, and it has 15 wind turbines in the city. They never zoned against wind turbines. Uh -huh. Nobody cares. Yeah. But here so we... So they're all over the place. They're all over the place. The Ford dealer has one, and the Chevy dealer has <laughs> yeah. one, and the, the, the hospital uh, has the one. Hospital the hospital, in this particular one. case, has a wind turbine. Next, to, it's actually, if you see, look at that, you'll see. The wind turbine is between the staff parking lot and the back door. Mm -hmm. If that wind turbine fell over, I think, I honestly think it would land on the hospital roof. If kind it of looks like wrong, it would. Wrong direction. They are not particularly concerned about wind turbine syndrome. People I would in, think. <laughs> people in Kansas don't get wind turbine <laughs> syndrome. And if you want to know why, you can read the Australian Medical Association's position paper on wind turbine syndrome, which says unequivocally that it is a placebo effect that is the result of the activity of anti-wind activists. Yeah. They are making people sick. Yeah. So it's not the turbine that's making people sick, it's people thinking about the turbine. Yeah, and other things too. But, you know, we could get into that argument, and I, I will tell you, I have looked into the arguments of the anti-wind activists, and it's not that I am so, having done that, I am not, I wouldn't identify myself as being pro-wind quite so much as I would identify myself as being anti-anti-wind, because I think they are... <laughs> literally making people sick and they are killing birds by preventing solutions from being being brought to bear and i know that there's going to be people in this world who say let's get rid of george harvey he's a nuisance <laughs> but you know that's the way people are okay anyway coming, that's coming out of Kansas. australia the, the, the comment about this is wind turbine syndrome is a valid disease is caused by a virus. Yes. And a virus is spread by word of mouth. You've told us that before, <laughs> Tom. Let's keep going. Yeah, it's still funny. Now this, this is, is an interesting one. This is a Darius wind turbine. I think that's probably pronounced right. And it just goes round and round with a with vertical axis. No matter which way the wind is blowing, this turns. Yeah, that's right. It doesn't care. And that means that in turbulent winds, it will continue. We have another one coming up called a Twisted Savonius. I'm, oh, it's I'm, twisted too, I, I, I tell you. It is, but <laughs> I wonder whether Savonius was twisted to come up with this design. This is a pretty quiet design, and um, they are being put in, again, in, in places. And we had that thing that we talked about last week where they had a thing that oscillated. Yeah, yeah. And I yeah, didn't yeah. have a good picture of that, but, you know, there are many ways of making power and power from the wind. And these things, some of them are not as quiet as others, but there's some of that's, them are really... That's probably pretty quiet. That one. Yeah, I think so. Some of them are very pretty. Let's look at the next slide. I've seen some of these things that were very small. Matter of fact, I saw building a house. People yeah. lived in it. had 40s on the four corners. Oh, really? Each one was maybe six feet high. Isn't that interesting? Now, there's a oh, pretty yeah. picture of wind turbines in Spain. <laughs> what do you say to that? <laughs> Well, Don just Quixote. like windmills to me. Yeah, yeah Don windmills. <laughs> Don Quixote would have known exactly what to do with those guys, right? <laughs> well, Don Quixote was as mad as the Hatter. Okay, let's keep going. Oh, here we have a water wheel. Uh, it's not the only way you can you can generate electricity is the wind turbine. Well, this is probably an old grinding mill, an old. Uh, I would guess this. Yeah. I think was. I, it was in the Appalachians, as I recall, in, the, in, in Pennsylvania or, or Ohio or something like that, the western part of the Appalachians. And now here is a weir. People should know about weirs. And remember, we're talking about sources of power for, for microgrids here. Yeah. Um, some hydropower doesn't even use dams. 
and the fish can can swim in in both directions. Well, a weir is like a, almost a dam. It's an almost dam. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a it's a barrage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a barrier. It's a barrage, and the the it is so low, and the water flows over it um, at a f small enough. It's amazing to me sometimes how fast fish swim when they feel like it, but they will go up that. Fl downward flow of river uh, of the of the water, soup. and they will yeah. you know you know yeah. and a salmon for crying out loud going up uh, would would not even get into that he'd just jump right over it. Yep. But um, that weir could produce power. Let's here we, this is from Little Green Hydro. Now James Perkins. These guys on. were here. They were here, and uh, James Perkins had one of those things on the show. I wanted to include this specifically because he was here and I understand it well. That thing is a water intake for a, for a water turbine. And the water turbine has such a high head that it uses very, very little water. So that's only about, what, a one-inch pipe, two-inch pipe? something Not like that. that. But, but the, the power of the water is a, is, is a function of the height the of height. the head the, and yeah. the volume of water. Right. So if you have a very high head, you can use a very small volume of water to get the same amount of power. And that thing has a screen on it that's fine enough that I don't know that mosquito larvae would go through that screen. But mm -hmm. certainly fish, well, you wouldn't have fish in that, in that little stream anyway. But, but uh, we, the, I think that actual unit was in this room, wasn't it? It was that, it was that it unit. Very yeah, much like it was it. very, very is, similar. The, the guy who owns it is powering his barn. Yes. Not yeah. the whole house, but just his barn. Well, there, there are a bunch of these things in place. There is a guy powering a barn with these. Let's, let's go on. The other end of that is this turbine, and you can kind of get an idea of the size of the it's turbine very big from either. the vi valve uh, handles. And that's the size of the turbine that powers the barn. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, the barn doesn't have a lot in it, but, you know, I mean, it's got lights and things and a bunch of cows and so forth. And uh, that is a solution to getting a small amount of power because the way that the microgrid works is you get power from whatever resources you got. If you're on a mountaintop, you got a good wheat resource in wind. So if he's got a little stream going through his property. That's right. And he's harnessed it. It hasn't hurt that's anybody. Right. That's right. And he's not, he's not uh, uh, destroying anything in the environment. And by the way, that intake preferentially will allow the stream to flow. So if the water flow get, goes down, the turbine stops turning, mm -hmm. but the stream keeps flowing mm -hmm. so that the en environment is safe. Mm -hmm. Let's keep going. Now, this is another one. We've seen this picture before yes, on, we have. on our shows. This is a, an Archimedes screw turbine. It's basically the auger in the meat mm -hmm. grinder. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, there are a bunch any of, kind of auger. Any yeah, kind yeah. of auger. But um, the water flowing down that slope turns the auger and the auger uh, uh, turning produces electricity. Now, if you wanted to, you could push electricity into this thing, turn the auger the opposite direction, and use it as a pump to pump, pump the water. Right. And those Archimedes screw turbines are so gentle that they are actually used in fish hatcheries to move fry around. Okay. All right? So these things are, these things are not environmental nightmares. And by the way, there's no dam here. There's a there's a there's a it's like a sluice or sluice something. that yeah. that brings water down from farther upstream. There's always water flowing through the stream. Little pond there. Yeah. There's no there's no dam. That's where you could use something from a weir. Yep. And as a matter of fact, the queen got two of these things put in, much bigger than this one, at Windsor Castle and on the Thames. Now you mm -hmm. know what the Thames mm -hmm. looks like. It's flat. Mm -hmm. It looks like it's not even in motion unless the mm -hmm. tide's flowing. But at Windsor Castle, they have two of these things, and that's what powers Windsor Castle. Okay. All right. You think she could afford to, to pay the electric bill, couldn't you? I don't know. But she, <laughs> she, her, her family is very environmental. Prince Charles is very environmental, too. Um, now, this, this is a biodigester. I had a smaller picture of a biodigester, which is a home unit. You can actually buy for about $500 a kit to make a biodigester that would be the size of a home unit. Now, technically, in most, in many places, you're not supposed to have your own biodigesters for human waste, mm -hmm. but you could certainly use them for food waste, for mm -hmm. agricultural waste, and things like that. These are agricultural waste-sized biodigesters. They're not in the United States. They're 
more primitive than American biodigesters would be, but they're... We make them out of plastic. <laughs> we make, we make biodigesters, they're almost off-the-shelf items now. <laughs> and there's about six, 16 or 17 of them in Vermont. But depending upon what you're putting them in, you can use them for different purposes. You can use them for, for human waste, and if you're using them for human waste, then, then the compost that you're developing shouldn't be used on certain kinds of applications. You don't want to grow yeah, your carrots okay. in yeah. unresolved in human waste. Human waste. Yeah. But um, agricultural waste would be a different kind of thing. And then, yet again, and this is a big one, um, in, in London, I, somebody I read was putting $270 million into a biodigester that was going to deal with the waste from London kitchens, restaurants, home kitchens, and hospitals, and things like that. Now somebody in London is doing it just with coffee grounds. They're, they do it with just <laughs> coffee grounds. But this is a, a waste system where they're, where they're, they're getting their waste from restaurants, and what they want to do is, is restrict it to restaurants because that means that if they're, and particularly in London, almost all, maybe all the restaurants use organic food. And oh. so they've got waste, which is compost that can be used as organic fertilizer. Mm -hmm. And that's valuable. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's look at the next slide here. This is um, a pair of anaerobic digesters that, home, that hold 3 million gallons of sludge each. And so these, they're pretty big. They're big. They're in Maryland. And this is one of the things that they want to do in Maryland and also on Lake Champlain. They want to get all the waste that's going into the water, Lake, uh, um, uh, Chesapeake Bay in Maryland, Lake Champlain in Vermont, all the waste. They want to stop as much of that as they can. That'll get the phosphorus out of there. Mm -hmm. it'll, it'll ease the environmental uh, stress and use that waste to make electricity and to make compost, the compost used to make fertilizer. And that reduces the, uh, the, the um, uh, environmental impacts. And that, again, is a system that can be used in microgrid. We've got lots of, what I'm mm -hmm. trying to show here is the opportunities we've got in microgrids. Let's keep going. Now, this is the Yenbacher engine that I mentioned earlier um, in regard to uh, Gersink. And I think that actually might be the Yenbacher engine that's in Gersink. Uh, it's a big diesel generator with glow plugs because it's running gas. Uh, it's a V20, as I recall. This thing's big enough to go into a locomotive. Yeah, I was just going to say, this is something you find in a train. That's right. Yenbacher made train loco locomotive uh, diesels before it made these gensets. And um, GE bought Yenbacher out after it started making these. And you can use the biogas that comes from biodigesters. Uh, in these engines, mm -hmm. and it's probably better to burn that gas than it is to release it into the atmosphere mm -hmm. because it's methane. Mm -hmm. And w I don't know exactly how much of that would be released if it were just dumped some, if the waste were just dumped somewhere, like on a field or whatever. But there would All be... All of it. There would be, I think, in a, in, in, an, in a situation where there's an aerobic possibility it might be making co2 instead but mm -hmm. it won't always mm -hmm. it you know i mean when when termites eat something they make methane just like cows do i didn't know that yeah yeah okay so anyway that's um that's something that can be used in a in a uh, uh microgrid to make electricity let's and here we've got now we're getting into the business of what do you do when your diesel generator your um uh, solar p panels, your wind turbines, your hydro, when they all stop at once, I guess that'll happen sooner or later, you use batteries. These batteries are kind of old. Uh, they're a museum <laughs> piece. <laughs> it almost looks like food being served from the top of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, anyway, those are the, and they're like car batteries, you know, and they're, they're not identical, but they're, if you saw, showed one to a person who knew what a car battery looked like, he'd say, yeah, that's a battery. These were probably used by the telephone company for backup power in case the power stopped, the telephones would work. Yeah, they had microgrids. Yeah, basically they did. <laughs> yeah, basically It's an old they idea. Did. Yeah. Okay, let's keep going. My, my great-grandfather had a microgrid. This is Tesla's new battery. What do you think of this? Mm. Well, this was only the first iteration of yeah, it. Yeah, and by the way, you know the three thousand uh, dollar price tag on this on the uh, on the battery. Yeah, that is the retail price. 
That's got, the retail price. That's, that's the what retail the price. consumer you pays that's for. That's right. I got that information this morning. Let's keep going. It, it, well, Tesla's not the only the way, battery. Green Mountain Power. Green Mountain Power has made a deal with Tesla. Made a deal. It was the first utility to make a deal with Tesla. To, and, and this is brilliant. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Green Mountain Power makes it so easy for people to finance their batteries. Okay. You do it as part of your electric bill. They, it's part of the electric bill. It actually reduces your electric bill because they're not selling you as much yeah. power. What are they getting out of it? Well, one thing that they're getting out of it is the grid becomes more stable. Yep. And that means that their whole system is more predictable than it was. It makes okay. the whole thing a whole lot easier. This, and they don't have to pay a, a high premium for uh, peak power. Yeah, that's right. Which is sometimes four times sometimes, or more the price of It can be retail. very expensive. Yep. Here is a flow battery. And it's a very different system than the kinds of systems that most people are familiar with. They have two ele electrolytes. They flow past each other, usually with a membrane in between. This particular one comes from Imergy. They use vanadium. Vanadium is very, very expensive. But Imergy figured out that they could get the vanadium they needed out of fly ash. And they could recover it very cheaply from fly ash. This means that they could have batteries that are not that expensive. They just sold about two weeks ago, or three weeks ago, um, uh, a, a thousand of these batteries to Sun Edison to be used in microgrids in India. And those batteries are 100 kilowatt hours each. So, and these things are limited only by the size of the reservoir. That, that's right. The, the, the uh, power of the battery is, is based on the battery. The energy stored in the battery is rate based on the reservoirs. Yeah. So if you rate, you rate it as a 100 megawatt battery, that'll tell you the, si the actual physical size of the center section. If you say it's a, a 200 megawatt hour battery, that means that the reservoirs will hold two, 200 megawatt hours. And this is a, this, these batteries will last almost forever. There's no depositing being done. The there's electrolytes, no degradation. It's there's just, no it's degradation. Just pumping the just only fluid back and forth. That's right. The only difference is that the, the um, ions in the electrolytes take on different levels of charge. Mm -hmm. So this is, a, this is a system that it's a mechanical system. The pumps can fail. Mm -hmm. um, things can crack, baseballs can come flying through the window and hit something, <laughs> you know, things can go wrong. But nevertheless, a system like this uh, could conceivably last for 35 years, you know, or more. Um, the next slide shows what it looks like and a 30 megawatt hour system, which would keep an average home going uh, for about 36 hours. Um, at, at its normal consumption. The, the home that so I... So everything's normal for about 36 hours. Yeah. Now, if, you, if you're smart, you have a smart system and you shut down all the circuits that you're not going to use. So you leave your refrigerator you're, on. The refrigerator, the, the furnace, the whatever, and maybe, you know, the radio, television, maybe a computer, a couple mm -hmm. of light bulbs. Don't dry some LEDs. Clothes. Don't go using your clothes dryer unless you've got the heat part turned off altogether. <laughs> but, um, Which works too, by the way. It does. But even that would draw more power than you might want to use. That battery is about six and a half by six and a half feet, and it's about four and a half feet tall, and it holds thirty megawatt, uh, thirty kilowatt hours. So, so it would fit in almost anybody's garage. It would. F you could probably put two of those in a person's yeah. garage with yeah. no difficulty. And the the, the battery costs now about five hundred dollars per uh, kilowatt hour. So the thirty. Uh, kilowatt hour battery, which would keep a normal house going normally for about 36 hours, would cost about $15,000. They want to bring that down to 300 at some point. I don't know when. It's going to come down because there, there's Tesla out there. Well, in some <laughs> respects, this is a better battery than Tesla's. Yeah. And in other respects, it's not. Yeah. And I think that if Elon Musk were here, he would say, yeah, that's true. He probably would, yeah. You know, he probably would. So let's keep going. Here we have uh, another type of power storage. We've got the possibility of making f hydrogen in a fuel cell. You can use the hydrogen in a fuel cell. A fuel cell is kind of like a battery. It, it, it can go either way. You can yeah. use a fuel cell to make hydrogen to be used in a fuel cell to make electricity, which makes it a battery because you can store the hydrogen. Or you could use the uh, fuel cell to make hydrogen, which would be used in an, in an internal combustion machine or you know whatever. Yeah. We've yeah. got lots of different ways to go. 
And one of the ways, let's go to the next slide. So the nice thing about fuel cells is they basically operate at room temperature. <laughs> yes, they can. They don't get hot. They don't, well, some of them get hot. A little warm. No, they, they the get fuel hot. Fuel cells can get very hot. Okay. Um, depending, uh, this is like Depends on many the different kinds of fuel cells. Yeah. And yeah. some of them will break hydrogen off of methane, for example. And they can get hot and they will produce carbon as a byproduct. Okay. Okay, let's go to the next one. Another thing that you can do with this is you can use the hydrogen as a feedstock. We're talking about microgrids here. We're talking about, you want to put in a microgrid? Well, maybe it would be good to think about, yeah, what are the chemical implications of that? You can use hydrogen to make other fuels, such as if you've got methane coming out of a biodigester, you can make uh, 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 propane, you can make um, propanol, you can make ammonia, you can make a bunch of different things. Ammonia is a fuel that can be used in an internal combustion mm -hmm. engine. In, in Holland, I think it was, no, sorry, it was Belgium, during the Second World War, the buses were run on ammonia instead mm -hmm. of oil. Mm -hmm. And that ammonia, when it burns, there's no carbon dioxide, just water. there's no carbon. Yeah, just you water. Know, it's made by combining hydrogen, which comes from your little fuel cell or something else, with nitrogen, with from, nitrogen the air. from the air. When you burn <laughs> it, you use oxygen from the air, which got there because you split it from water, and it uses that oxygen to take the hydrogen off and make the water. It puts the nitrogen back in the air, and you're exactly where you started. So this is pretty environmentally sound, it's, isn't it? It's pretty environmentally sound. And you can, you know, there are a lot of different things. Again, you can do this in a microgrid. Go ahead. And you use a flywheel. Flywheel. Oh my <laughs> gosh. <laughs> Store energy in a flywheel. Is this practical? Practical? Can it be done? It is being done. There's one right over by North Adams. It's right inside of New York State. It's in Petersburg. Yeah, we should go it's over there. It's been and take there a look for it. many maybe years. Two years. Yeah. It's, it's a while. <laughs> Somebody is reminding you of something. Yeah. Let's keep going. <laughs> I'd like to see this because this, yeah. this is interesting. My, my concept, and this is crazy because it just came to me. Yeah. I was thinking of this thing being more like a phonograph record. Yes, I did too when I first thought about it. But and this I makes was, a lot more sense. They got yeah. magnetic bearings, so they're lasting forever. It's operating in a vacuum, yeah. so there's no air slowing it down. Yeah. And P it's these just, are another, scientists. just another idea. Yeah, these it's are an scientists. old idea, but it's being used in a new way. Right. These are scientists who have done this. They are not a bunch of wackading hoys. Well, they could be wacky too, but they're I suppose they, it could be. Yes. All right. <laughs> Next one. Next, Next one. slide. Yeah, let's do this. Oh, here we go. Pumped storage. By golly, this is kind of a schematic that shows how Northfield Mountain works. And mm -hmm. I will point out, Northfield Mountain has an output that is at peak capacity, just about twice Vermont Yankees. It's about very interesting. Yeah, yes. I suppose it is. Yes. You take the water when when power is cheap, which is in the middle of the night. You pump the water up to the from the low reservoir to the high reservoir. When power is dear, you let it run from the high reservoir down to the low reservoir, generating electricity. Again, this is something that can be done in a microgrid, and we've talked about that that little reservoir that's up on the top of mm -hmm. um, oh um, right up right right up over the retreat. Oh yeah. Um, and, you know, the possibility that maybe that could be used as a tiny little uh, pumped storage system. For well, it sounds growth. tiny little, but it actually would generate significant it amounts would, of power. It would generate power, sure. It would fit very naturally into a microgrid. Yeah, I think so. It would indeed. Now, our next one. Tom, you know, I, I couldn't go by without doing this <laughs> because every once in a while when we talk about pump storage, we talk about you bring up that thing that you read about hopper cars being filled with stone. and They ran them up a mountain. They run them down at night <laughs> or, or during the day. Or yeah, you run them up at night. You run them down during the day. You, they use power going up the mountain at night when the power costs two cents a kilowatt hour. You run them down during the day when you can sell the power at wholesale for 25 cents a kilowatt hour. So it's a way to make money, but it also means that you've got a way to store power. Storing power on a microgrid is important. The power comes from a lot of it. The cheapest place to get power, ultimately, is the sun and the wind. So, you know, there it is. So that's a way to store the power from the sun and the wind. And we have the possibility of cryogenic energy storage. You pump, you, you compress air and cool it at the same time until the nitrogen 
drops out as a liquid. As a liquid. And then you can boil the nitrogen to run things. Well, the liquid nitrogen is far denser than the gaseous nitrogen. Oh, yeah. So, so you need you a very small storage You take this whole unit. room full and put it in a couple of gallons. A couple of gallons? I bet you'd put it in a teacup. But you think so? <laughs> no, not really. I think it would be more like a couple of gallons. Yeah. But the, the point is you can store it in something small. The pr one problem with cryogenic storage is... It's cold. <laughs> it's, you have to keep it cold, too, because it'll boil. And um, so it'll, it'll boil off. But if it does boil off, you know, all you're doing is you're losing nitrogen into the atmosphere. And the atmosphere is 80% nitrogen to begin with. So what difference so is going There's no pollution be? there. No pollution, unless you happen to be talking about some poor critter that flies into the middle of the nitrogen <laughs> that's coming off, which might be too cold or lack too, much, uh, la too lacking in oxygen. Let's go on. Another thing that we have here is the possibility of simply compressing air. And this generator in Germany has been powered by air for over 30 years. It's not liquefied, it's just compressed. It's not liquefied, it's just compressed. Which brings us to another thing. What is the problem with renewables? It isn't that they are uniquely intermittent. The whole grid is intermittent. Everything is intermittent. Just a different cycle. This thing was using air for 30 years. And the pump storage, the first pump storage in the United States that I'm aware of was put in, up in Connecticut in the 1920s. It was back up for the daily changes in power supplies in the 1920s. Okay, well, I think that uh, they had some sort of pump storage at Niagara. Yeah, yeah, they did. A long time ago, maybe it was 1890s. A long, well, like in that case, it would have been before my yeah. thing. I know that they had one. Yeah, it was, was on the Housatonic. It was on the Housatonic, yeah. 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 Let's keep going. I think that, that, that one's still available to visit. They, they have, yeah. it's still operating. Yeah, Flat Home. Flat Home is the, is the southernmost point in Wales. And that picture, it's kind of hard to see. It has a lighthouse. It, the light, just to the right of the lighthouse is a small barracks, which might have been, oh, wouldn't have been, as, I don't think even a company would have fit into that thing. It was too small. There's a uh, dairy farm. There's a um, cottage for the foghorn keeper. <laughs> <laughs> but there's also three solar arrays, a wind turbine, and two battery systems, which kind of tells me that maybe they've got not just one microgrid, but two mutually supporting microgrids. Uh -huh. And that is used as a kind of a test bed for microgrids in the UK. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, basically what, this, what it boils down to is a microgrid gives the community an ability like this to operate on using its own power. Save a lot of money, mm -hmm. a lot of money. Mm -hmm. In Brattleboro, we ship $24 million a year out of the community. Every year, we lose $24 million to some other part of the world. Mm -hmm. Most of that goes out of Vermont because we're buying electrical power that's supplied from outside, from outside of, Vermont. of Vermont. And it's electrical power that we could supply locally, which would entail reducing our power costs. Do you, do you think we might be able to stand doing that? <laughs> it would mean that a couple of people would have to be hired anyway. Do yeah. you suppose we could stand doing that, even though well, it, as we speak, it is being planned it is or being, being planned. done? It is being done. But I want people to understand why. And there it is. It's because we're more secure. We can survive Hurricane Irene or Hurricane Sandy come back online as soon as the local repairs are made. We don't have to worry about repairs coming from other parts of the world because it's going to save us money. $24 million a year in our economy would mean a lot. And if we did it really well, we could do it not only with electricity, but we could use more, more electricity than we currently use to reduce our, our dependence on fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. Gradually, over a period of years, we could, we could reduce our use of oil, propane, and things like that. And believe it or not, the fossil fuel companies have got lots of things that they can do without, oh, yeah. you know, I mean... We really I'm, don't have to worry about them. They're worried about them. They're worried about but themselves. But yeah. if we manufactured our own, our own ammonia 
and our own propane, they could be delivering the propane to houses. Yep. They could be delivering the ammonia to bus companies and possibly even to other companies to be burned. It would increase our, um, the, the, the quality of our atmosphere. It would increase the, it would mean that we'd, I mean, you know, you well, think about it, it would mean we'd be dusting our furniture less. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even think of that, about that one. They wouldn't be delivering propane to houses because it would be cheaper to heat your house with electricity. It would be cheap. Well, yes, it, it would be, unless, unless you had uh, um, a, a thermal utility, which, you know, people have talked about in Brattleboro. And there are people still talking about that. Yeah. Yeah. We've got a lot of things that we can do. We want to go back to where we were when we started, and we want to say that ensuring our quality of our life could be less expensive than taking the risk that we entail by continuing to power ourselves the way that we currently are. And you know who would help us? Is our own utility. Oh, yeah. They've said so. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, folks... And uh, I think that... Microgrids are going to happen in Brattleboro. It's only a matter of time. Only a matter and, of time. And uh, Green Mountain Power will be involved in helping it happen. That's right. Let's uh, say goodbye to everybody. We will have more on microgrids, I have no doubt, because we're going to do that. And we're also going to be talking on other special shows about, well, um, about resilience. Next week, yeah. we will have guests, I am told. Yeah. Who will be from Co-op Power in Brattle in, Co uh, Power is in, in Greenfield. Greenfield. And they will be talking about biodiesel. Which so is, they're about to cr start making their own biodiesel for sale. They hope. They yeah. have to, they have yeah. to raise a, a f go through a final fundraising. So it's a matter of money right now. It's just a matter of, 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 of borrowing a little bit of money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See you next time. Bye. You remembered to do your right hand. <laughs> <laughs> My right hand is the right hand. <laughs> I suppose. Very good. I want to point out that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land. So lovely earth can stay lovely still.